to number 660, 660. That will be our song here. There's a habitation. But Matthew's going to lead us in that, and after that, um, Brother Marty's going to lead our prayer. go ahead and open your Bibles now to Proverbs chapter 26. We're going to begin in verse 20, chapter 26, beginning with verse 20. There's so many different ways for a person to read God's Word. You can do so when you get up in the morning when your mind is fresh. You can do so at lunch when you have an opportunity for a few minutes. You can do so in the evening before you go to bed uh, I don't know if you're about, when you get my age, though, if you're not careful, you start reading then, you read two verses, and you're gone. Uh, but there's another way to read God's Word, and uh, that's through the means of having a digital copy, or used to be on tape. But when I mow grass, it takes me about an hour. And you'd be surprised how much Bible reading you can get in an hour of time. And uh, it's amazing, if you want to do this, I usually put my earphones in so I can hear, but uh, when I get to this section of the book of Proverbs, I want to stop and say, oh boy, that's a good lesson. Oh, that's a good lesson. That's a good lesson. But I force myself to just keep it going. And what I do is then I begin to appreciate Solomon has trains of thought that I didn't always see before because I was stopping one verse at a time. And uh, Solomon will do this. He'll do just like our parents did. Our parents will start lecturing you on something and then stop and go to something else and then come back to where they were at all over again. And uh, have you ever heard what is the way to teach? Repetition, repetition, repetition. And there's some of the things that Solomon will say that are so profound, he hits it and then goes on. Hits it and goes on. But then he keeps coming back to it and it just resonates with you. 
And I think that's where we're at uh, today. Let's go to verse 20 now. We're going to read verses 20 through 22. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. There's no tailbearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coal, and so wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of tailbearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. Wow, that is just really profound. We want to spend a little bit of time talking about this here. Um, what do you mean there's no wood, the fire goes out? Nothing to burn. No fuel. Well, guess what happens when you don't provide fuel to an argument? Have you ever heard this phrase? Boy, he just threw gas on that. What does that mean? They made it worse, the fuel. You know, gas is very, very flammable. Uh, I don't know if y'all have ever tried to do something stupid uh, with gas. I remember we lived in Clarksville. Uh, we lived in a snake crossing. And y'all know what I think about snakes. First, seemed like a year we were there, uh, Mark was a little old bitty baby boy, and he walks out and he steps on a big snake about this big. And it crawls up under the sidewalk. I thought, I am not going to let that snake live. And I poured gas in that. <laughs> of course, I thought, I don't want to get burned, so I poured me a little strand, stream all the way out to the gravel. I throw a match down. Boom, it lays, raises the sidewalk up. <laughs> I don't believe that the snake survived. If he did, he had a really bad headache. But uh, you throw gas on something, and what happens to it? It explodes. Where there's no wood, the fire goes out. Where there's no tail bearer, strife ceases. What is really the only way to stop strife from continuing? Stop the tail bearing. Stop the talking. Uh, to get rid of that, you've got to get rid of the contentious man. Um, let me just offer you some passages which I think are helpful here. Let's go to chapter 16 and verse 28. He said, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisper separates best friends. A whisper, it says, sows strife. What is a whisper? Okay, he's a tail bear, but there, there's a little uniqueness to this word. Behind your back. What is a whisper? Yeah, you, you, you don't elevate the volume of your voice because you don't want this person to hear it. They're a person who's going to tell something in secret, not let everybody else hear it. They're going to run and they're going to tattle this to this person, tattle this to that person. But hey, don't tell anybody I told you this. Let's go to chapter 22 and verse 10. Cast out the scoffer and contentions will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. I know we've heard people be withdrawn from for immoral sins, sexual sins. Do you think there will be a time and a place to withdraw from a gossip busybody who never repented and wouldn't stop? What does he say to do to that scoffer? There in chapter 22, verse 10. Cast him out. And when he does, what does he say would happen? Strife will cease. You know, in the gospel advocate, when I was first starting to preach, 
there was a section in the back of it that where people would write in reports. They would say, I went and held a meeting at uh, this church and so many people were baptized. They, they would generally put it like this, there's so many added to the Lord. That's a good way to put it. I believe it was uh, Brother Leonard Johnson, I'm not sure, but I think it was him, made a statement that said they went and held a meeting and there was like 20 subtractions. And he said it was a very successful meeting. Now, would you tend to think if you went to a gospel meeting and held it and there were subtractions that there would be a good meeting? If they're the problem, they're the cause of it. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard of congregations that are struggling and they have contentions and they have fights and they have difficulties and then you have a funeral and what happens? Everything just calms down. That's what he's talking about here. Let's go to chapter 17 and verse 14. The beginning of strife is like the releasing of water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Can things get out of hand quickly? Yes. You know, you can have two people who you think are reasonable and rational, and next thing you know, they're both screaming at each other. And what he's saying here is stop contention before a quarrel starts. That's part of what this class is about this morning is if you recognize here where there's no wood, the fire goes out, where there's no tail bear, the strife ceases. Hey, if I'm the problem, what do I need to do? Stop. Be quiet. Well, let's look at verse 21. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood is to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. What does he mean by contentious? That's his intent. Um, you ever been with somebody who wanted to get two dogs to fight with each other? I've heard, seen them, I've actually seen them. They take two dogs and rub their noses together. You know what most dogs will end up doing is you rub their noses together? They're going to fight. Do you believe there's some people who really love to see an argument get started? Yeah. And uh, he says, that is the way the contentious man kindles strife. Now, verse 22 is very important in this context. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. Now, that's a real interesting question. What is a tasty trifle? Okay. Some good, you know. Uh, how many of you ever had baklava? Baklava. B-A-K-L-A-V-A. -A. You can get it at uh, uh, Gondola. Uh, you can get it at Christmas time, usually at Sam's. What they do, they take this flour and they roll it out in thin sheets, as thin as a sheet of paper, and they put honey in between it and pistachio, and they stack up 30, 40 layers of that stuff, and then they cut it in little small squares. If you've never had baklava, you don't know how good some things can taste. I mean, that stuff is just like, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's got to be simple because it tastes too good. Uh, well, when the King James was translated, they didn't know what the word meant very well. And so they were trying their best to get the original word for tasty is the word choice, like the very best of something. And then the word trifles is the word for a morsel, like a morsel of food. So the idea is something that 
really, really tastes good, but it's, it's a small amount. It's not large. It's, it's a, when you put it together here. Now, let me ask you a question. If somebody comes up and tells you, have you heard? Now, forget what else follows that. What's the next thing in your mind? Tell me. I'm going to hear it. Have you heard what so-and-so did? Nobody knows about it yet. Do we have an eager desire to hear stuff? Have you heard? Mm -hmm. the, the background thought about this is the words of a talebearer are just something that you really want to hear what they've got to say. Is it hard to say no to a person trying to tell you something that you don't need to hear? It is for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but somebody comes along and they say, hey, have you heard this? No, I hadn't. Well, go ahead and tell me now. You done got me, you got me curious. No, I tell them I can't keep a secret. Because <laughs> they tell hey, can you keep a secret? No, I can't keep it. Okay, I ain't going to tell you then. <laughs> okay. That's true. Well, let's go to this next phrase here in this passage. That's what Pat just brought up over here. Uh, here. Here's the difficulty. When you're taking Hebrew words that you're not familiar with and you're trying to guess what they come from, you start working with root words. And sometimes a root word will tell you what it comes from, sometimes it won't. But as they dig up more stuff and they learn more stuff about the use of these words, primarily in contracts and stuff like that, uh, you start understanding. And so we know a little bit more now than we did in 1611 about the meaning of that Hebrew word. And so I'm not critical of the King James. Don't think that. I, I think it's a great translation. There's just some places where the word is better understood. And sometimes you have to have the, the Greek Septuagint to be able, which is a Translation done before the uh, uh, before Jesus was born, the Greek translation that to understand how the words were actually used, and so the idea is here something of a, something that's a tasty morsel of food. But notice the last part of this phrase here, and they go down in the inmost body. If somebody tells you a tale about somebody. Does that change your relationship with them? It shouldn't, but it does. If somebody tells you they saw somebody at car parked in front of a liquor store. Now, that's all they tell you. They saw their car parked in front of a liquor store. Okay. The person who told you that should have been the one who went and asked. They shouldn't have told you that before they found out what they were doing to start with. But you know, here's the problem. Can somebody be driving along in that road and all of a sudden their car break down and quit running and it coast into a uh, parking lot in front of a liquor store? Flat tire? All kinds of things. You know, there are people who can be guilty of evil surmisings. But somebody tells you that they saw somebody's car parked in front of a liquor store. What's the immediate thought that goes into your mind? They're hitting the bottle. They're drinking. Now, somebody comes along and says, well, I heard later that wasn't true. What's stuck in your mind? You know, that it's hard to unhear something 
and especially something that's untrue, and then pretty soon it becomes true regardless of whether it is or not. And so he's trying to say, you have to be careful that you don't just absorb this, take it in, and let it go down. The best thing to do is say, I can't keep a secret. Best thing to do is say, I don't want to hear it. Of course, when that happens, people are like, what do you mean you don't want to hear it? I'm not a gossip or anything. Well, that would be nice, but I've had times where my vehicle stopped, and that's as far as it's going to go. I've got another comment or two, but I'm going to leave it alone. Let's go to verse 23 through 26. Fervent lips with a wicked heart is like earthenware covered with silver dross. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Now, um, let's start back here at verse 23. Fervent lips with a wicked heart. That's a combination there. What would fervent lips be? Okay. Passionate. You know, they feel strongly about this. The Bible talks about the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Uh, it's effectual, but it's fervent. In other words, it's given from the heart. You take somebody who believes what he is saying with, and you combine that with a wicked heart, is that bad or really bad? That's really bad. I mean, it's, it's just terrible. Now, um, the Septuagint, I mentioned that, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, translates this word as flattering. The original Hebrew word means burning, but instead of fervent, it uses the word flattering. Flattering lips with a wicked heart. That even conveys a little bit different idea. What does somebody do when they're flattering you? They're trying to butter you up for the kill, so to speak. Um... There's some passages which I think are helpful here before I even get to the latter part of this. In chapter 20 and verse 19, he said, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. Don't associate with somebody who flatters with his lips. Chapter 26 and verse 28 he says, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flat, flattering mouth works ruin. And then in chapter 29 and verse 5, he said, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. What does Solomon think about flattery? He's against it. It's bad because that person is telling you, hey, I'm with you. I believe in you. I think the world of you. But he doesn't mean that. A lot of flattery. He's probably, you know, and but for Solomon's case, most of it was true. But uh, now here's the difficult part. I understand what earthenware is. You know what earthenware is? Common stuff, made from clay. But then he talks about covered with silver. That word there, dross, makes it difficult for me. What is dross? 
It's what you don't want of the silver, the bad stuff that's on it. Now, there's two different ways you could take this. You could have silver on top of a plate, but you'd have dirty silver. The other is the possibility of, here's a recent study, just in the last probably 30, 40 years, is the root word here is ugaritic, which means it's from another section, and it means to glaze. Do you know what glazing is? My grandmother used to love to do pottery. She took a class in it, and she made tons of stuff of pottery. She made uh, cookie jars and plates and stuff to give away, and she would take it and put a glaze on it and then put it in an oven and bake it. Now, what was the purpose of putting a glaze on it? Seals it up, protects it. It makes it pretty, doesn't it? Covers up the clay, makes it pretty. Fervent lips with a wicked heart is like earthenware with a glaze coating. In other words, it's covering up what's under it. And in this case, silver, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you ever noticed, but most of our jewelry today is not solid gold. What is it? It's called plated. It has an extremely thin layer of gold on the outside, and the inside something cheap. And I think that's the idea that he has here. Let me take you to another passage of Scripture, which I think is valuable here. Well, let me go into verse 24, and then I'll do that. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within himself. What's he trying to do when he speaks to you? He's hiding his intentions. In other words... What is it? Why do you disguise something? To hide it? Mm -hmm. Alan? I'm glad you used the word sugar coat. Because that's really the idea, isn't it? Why would you sugar coat something? People will like it. They'll want it. And uh, when you go to passages like chapter 23 and verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. You know that part of it. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. He'll say, eat and drink, but what does he think? Somebody puts a piece of, of food in front of you and says, now, we've got a chicken here and said there's all of its dark meat except for that one breast. Of it. Now, you can have the breast if you want it. What's that? Why do you know that? He told you you could have it if you wanted it. <laughs> what he's trying to do is disguise what he's saying. Did you come up here and read my notes? <laughs> uh, no, really, that's, that's the point. I mean, uh, is people will profess something when in reality they're hiding their true intent of heart. Let me give you a couple, another verse, and then we'll go to what Willie is pointing out. Chapter, the book of Psalms, chapter 12, in verses 2 and 3, he says, They speak idly everyone to his neighbor or with his neighbor, with flattering speech and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. There are people trying to butter up David, and David recognizes that. But uh, what you have is there were people who did that to the Lord. You know, Lord, we know that no one uh, speaks the truth like you do. You don't have any, uh, you know, partiality toward men, you'll just tell the truth just like it is. But the Bible says they did that testing him. What's their motivation of heart? 
They're trying to entrap him in something he's saying. Sometimes when people are flattering you, they're trying to, to find out what you know. And they're trying to uh, pry information out of you. And in doing so, they don't have the right attitude of heart. They're disguising what they're saying with their lips. Well, let's go down to verse 25. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him. Now, um, sometimes people will praise you to your face, but then do what when they leave? Stab you in the back. He says, when they speak kindly, do not believe them, for there are seven abominations. What are you talking about, seven abominations? There's six things the Lord hates. Seven are abomination to him, chapter 6 of Proverbs. Seven was the number for perfection, the number of completion. Seven abominations in his heart. He is completely motivated by some other reason than what is right. Though his hatred is covered by deceit. In other words, he really hates you, but he's telling you something else so that you won't know what he's doing. His wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Now, that's something that uh, I think needs to be observed. You know what happens to talebearers usually? Someone tells Ray something, and Ray tells Tommy something, and Tommy tells Willard something. And then somebody says, that's not true. Willard, who told you? Well, Tommy told me. Tommy, who told you? Well, Ray told me. You know what happens pretty soon? It gets back to the source. And then what happens to them? They're embarrassed in front of everybody. They say, well, I don't know what you're all so upset about. <laughs> That is exactly what Solomon is heading at in verses 23 through 26. Now, how does that tie to what was just previously studied in verses 20 through 22? Where there's no wood, what happens? The fire goes out. In verses 20 through 26, I think Solomon is dealing with the practical matter that exists in a nation, it exists in a home, and it can exist in a church. And that is the bearing of tales. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who just demonstrate their own ignorance by some of the things that they say. Well, I'll give you one last verse. The book of Numbers, chapter 32 and verse 23. You probably can all quote that. Be sure that your sins will find you out. In other words, you, you do something that's wrong, it will come back to you. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it will come back to you. Okay, anybody else? Mm -hmm. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, verse 27 is a standalone. But I think it goes back to the point that he's just previously made. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Whoever rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. Now, uh, I, Solomon just has such a, an eloquent way of, of expressing things. And uh, the perpetrator is going to have it blow back on them. Um, the book of Psalms. Chapter 7 and verse 15 says, He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. Psalms chapter 9 and verse 15 says, The nations have sunk down into the pit which they have made and the net which they have hid, their own foot is caught. Esther chapter 7 and verse 10 said, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. You know what happens to people who try to set somebody else up? They fall in their own trap. They are trying to 
damage someone else, damage their reputation, damage what is good. And what Solomon says is, you know what's going to happen? It's going to come back on you, which is a good warning for us to say, okay, I'll just be quiet. If, I'm, if I'll be quiet, well, there's no wood, the fire goes out. If I don't say anything, I'm not going to be embarrassed by what happened. Okay, let's take verse 28 now. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Now, uh, in this, Solomon is focusing his attention on the person who's doing this. Why would a person say something bad about somebody else? What's the motivation? Well, sometimes think themselves look good, but what else? To hurt that person. In other words, you do it to that person because you want to hurt them. There's some malice there. He said, a lying tongue hates. You know, the reason why you lie about somebody is because you hate them. You, you don't have the right attitude toward them. And he says, hates those who are crushed by it. And uh, sometimes I don't think we realize when we hurt somebody, how bad it hurts. You've heard the old phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Is that true or not? That's not true. Uh, you may think that it, you can withstand it, but uh, it still has some um, lingering effects. That somebody makes you doubt yourself, make you doubt your worth, your abilities. Um, let's take a young person and you say something to them that discourages them. It can stop them from ever trying again. Maybe they're trying to lead a song and they pitch the song wrong. And somebody comes up and says, you know what? You maybe ought to leave, leave the singing to somebody who does a better job. What's going to happen to them? They'll say, hey, that's, maybe I'm not good enough at this to do it. Uh, and it has an effect. They're crushed by it. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I've dealt with people who had rumors started about them that were not true. And uh, the rumors gotten so big and so out of hand that now they can't, they can't stop it. They're crushed by it. And so he tells them the flattering mouth works ruin. Don't let this uh, ruin you. Uh, the best thing to do is to let that flatterer just say what he wants to say and you don't take it and you don't accept it and you don't do anything that reacts to it because you know what he's trying to do. He is trying to ruin you. And uh, let me give you a, what I think is a good example. I held, sort of held this in the book of Luke. Chapter 20 and verse 20 said, So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and authority of the governor. They're listening to what Jesus says and they're trying to pretend, oh, we just love your teaching, Lord. Just tell us a little bit more. We want to, we want, and the whole purpose is we want to go back to the authorities and we won't get you in trouble. No one faced more of this than Jesus. One more, and then I'll leave that alone. Chapter Matthew, chapter 22, and verses 15 and 16. This is in the context of. Uh, Jesus is, it's Tuesday, the busy day before he's going to be crucified on Friday. And he is bombarded by every group that you can conceive of. It's the Sadducees, it's the Pharisees, it's the Herodians. And it says in verse 15, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and that you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. 
And they're saying, we just want you to tell us now exactly because we know you'll tell it just like it is. Well, that's setting somebody up. Have you ever had somebody say, well, now, don't, don't couch it. Just tell me just like it was. Well, you have to be very careful of that because you may be saying something that somebody is wanting to use against you to try to ruin you to cause difficulties. If somebody in your family, in your congregation, in your community is having trouble, leave it alone. Don't make it harder on them and don't make it harder on yourself. Anybody have any comments or questions? I've got eight minutes, so I want to start into chapter 27, uh, verses 1 and 2. Um, go along with my sermon. I was going to try if I could get to these two verses for this morning because they go along with what I was trying to say in the lesson. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Now, um, there are two ideas in these verses. Both of them have the idea of bragging. The first one is bragging about what you will do. I'm going to do this. Um, in Isaiah 56 and verse 12, Come, one says, I will bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today and much more abundant. In other words, you come along, we'll both just, we'll get tanked up and everything will be right today and tomorrow. Or you remember Luke 12, verses 19 and 20. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, fool, tonight, this night, your soul will be required of you. And then whose will those things be which you have provided? You know, here's a man, he's been real successful, and he's made well in life, and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to be more successful tomorrow than I was today. I'm going to tear down the barns I've got now, and I'm going to fill them and fill more barns. What did God tell him? You're not going to fill any barns tomorrow. This night your soul will be required of you. You can make all kinds of great plans what you're going to do this week or next year, and you may not be here to do those things. Which leads me to the passage, which I think you're probably all thinking about, is James 4, 13 through 16. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city, spend a year and there and buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. That key word there is boasting. You boast about tomorrow. Look what I'm going to do. And rather than recognizing that God is in control of this world, God knows what can happen, will happen, and you don't. And so you ought to say, if the Lord wills. So the verse 1 is a man who boasts about what he is going to do. Now, verse 2, let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Here we're talking about a man who is bragging about what he has done. He's praising himself. Now, a um, couple of verses I used this morning in the lesson, Proverbs 25, 27, it's not good to eat much honey, so to seek one's own glory is not glory. Chapter 20, verse 6, most men will proclaim his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? Uh, there's a problem when we start trying to praise ourselves. And uh, how many of you have met people? I'm not talking about the politicians. I'm talking about people that you meet. They'll tell you how great they are. They start rattling off their educational degrees. I'm smarter than you are. Then they start telling you how much money they've got. They're wealthier than you are. And uh, pretty soon, what they're doing is they're trying to make you feel that they're superior to you. 
And in the Bible, are we superior to one another? No, we're not. And uh, I think about people like Solomon or Absalom. Uh, let me just give you one last passage, and we'll do this. Second Samuel, chapter fifteen, and verse four. I know you all remember Absalom, but you remember him for his what? Hair. But he had an ego that went was just as elevated as his long hair was. In 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 4, it, moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made the judge in the land, and everyone who has a suit or a cause would come to me, and then I would give him justice. And what he's saying is, you know, I'm really the person who is more capable, more talented, more able to help you than anybody else, particularly in this case, David. And if you just come to me, oh, I would be such a great judge. Um, when I hear politicians get up and they talk about, oh, I'm going to do this, 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 because I'm this smart, this capable, this talented. You know what I consider most of them to do? Blowing smoke. Because either they can't do it or won't do it for the most part. And uh, uh, Solomon is hitting at these people here who are praising themselves. And uh, the passage that I keep going back to I alluded to in my lesson this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where he says in verse 12, we dare not class or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, for they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Do we do that occasionally? Well, at least I'm not as bad as old brother so-and-so. Who do we pick to compare ourselves to? Lowest common denominator, the person that we can least do it. Well, what we're going to do is, Lord willing, next week we're going to pick up with verse 3, and Solomon's going to talk about jealousy and how bad it is, how badly it can affect you, how badly it can affect others. But appreciate everybody's attention and your comments today.